So hey guys, um, welcome to the second episode of Just a Chat With. We're here today with Marty Newmeyer, who is a branding legend and thought leader on brand and story. We have a very excited studio behind me and um, also myself and Louis are really excited to have you here in the studio with us. So I suppose um, for people who are watching and don't know who you are, yeah, I was just wondering, Marty, if you can maybe like tell us a bit about like, describing your own words, who you are, and kind of like a bit of your story. <laughs> yeah, actually, the um, my title uh, for Liquid Agency, where I'm employed most of the time, um, is Director of CEO Branding. So my job is to help CEOs tell their part of the brand story on behalf of a company. So I've uh-huh. done all the other things under that, and now I'm like a you know CEO uh, level, yeah, uh, and uh, have no no takers on that yet. So it's just it's brand new, <laughs> but we're seeing a need for that. So um, yeah. we'll see what happens. Is that a new title then? Is that? It's a new title. New Before title, yeah. I was director of transformation. Yeah, that's the one I've read. Yeah, yeah, which is still what I do really. Yeah. But but uh, we're pushing this idea that CEOs need their own brand yeah. that relates in a you know logical way to the company brand and that's a pretty mm. delicate balance because mm. you could overpower a brand by yeah emphasizing the leader instead of the company and yeah. vice versa so yeah there's a balance thing there you've got yeah. to kind of get right that's something that we can yeah. so if there are any CEOs on. out there uh, open for business <laughs> <laughs> great great so I suppose um, you know you've been in the design and brand world for you know um, a reasonable amount of time now like yeah. We'd be interested to kind of know, like, how, where did it all begin? Where did your journey start? Well, I started as an assistant to Gutenberg. Okay, okay. And I've been, uh, you know, since several centuries now. <laughs> I, was a, I was a graphic designer. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's all I ever wanted to be, graphic mm-hmm. designer. And uh, after about whew, 20, 30 years of that, I realized um, that that profession is incomplete because there's a gap between... Uh, any kind of design really and business strategy Um, two different worlds different languages and the result of that is that um, design can't be very effective unless it's really attached to uh, you know business outcomes and so I realized I had to do something about that just because I couldn't keep just doing the same thing you can be a super designer but if you um, if if you're not as concerned about results as the leaders of, of the companies you're working for yeah um, you, there's a limit to what you can do you know so you can do yeah. really great work in a vacuum yeah. you can win lots of awards but yeah. then where are you, you yeah, know? yeah. And, uh, I got tired of all that after about 20 30 years and started looking for ways to connect uh, the two worlds which led to my book the brand gap yeah. you know I identified that gap and it resonated with people and that was life-changing for me but I you know I was Pretty senior at that stage. I was probably late fifties when mm-hmm. I wrote that. And how did you? How did the book come around? So, like, what was your thinking at the time? What was the reason why you felt well, you had to I, put that out I, to the world? I had uh, before that um, sort of worked my way up in the design world to, um, you know, from a general designer doing everything mm-hmm. to uh, to go, moving to Silicon Valley and and focusing only on tech clients. Yeah which is pretty absurd because I know nothing about technology to this day. <laughs> but I realized that that's not what they need from me is to yeah. know their business. You know, yeah, they yeah. need what they need me, me to do is help translate what they do into uh, action in, in the marketplace, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. means developing a language uh, around technology. There was nobody doing that when I came yeah. in. It's like making it friendlier, making it understandable. Yeah. So my first clients were like uh, Atari, and Apple and mm. uh, Adobe systems and mm. um, you know I helped I helped introduce the Macintosh Plus yeah um, and it was the first one that you could actually do something with like you could print things yeah. using that <laughs> uh, and Adobe helped them launch PostScript because nobody knew how to explain that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what year? This was about two thousand. Is that right? Was that? Oh, this would be before that. Before this that, yeah. is Nineteen late eighties. Oh, late eighties. Yeah. Late 80s, Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, I did that, and uh, I realized that the idea of specializing in something for a designer was very powerful. Or you know, anybody, any business, specializing is uh, a way to increase profitability mm-hmm. because you eliminate competition. Yeah. The more specialized you are, 
So I was specialized in technology, but I realized that if I specialized further, I could make higher profits uh, if I could find something I wanted to specialize in. Mm -hmm. And then I realized what I really wanted to do was uh, the packages that software came in, mm -hmm. which doesn't do that too much anymore. I don't think mm -hmm. you get it in a package. You just download it. But at the time, you had to go into a store and, yeah. and, and buy it on a shelf. And I thought, that's a pretty cool thing to work on. I don't know anything about packaging, but... The front of a package is like a poster, and it's got an image of something, and it's mm -hmm. got a logo. I like logos. Yeah. The back is like a, a selling ad. The side is like a data sheet. Mm -hmm. I can do all those things. And, and so um, I just took that on as a specialty. I just uh, decided I would learn everything there was to learn about it. And mm -hmm. by um, testing, research in the store with customers, yeah. And then I just presented myself as, as the only guy who knew anything about it, uh, which is true. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that much, but I was the only one who cared enough to learn about it. And um, in the course of doing that, I mean, I, you know, Apple became my client. I did all the software for Apple. Yeah. Um, uh, all the major software companies had to at least talk to me. Yeah. And, and uh, so that was really successful. And in the course of that, I started to understand that... Um, I needed information from them about what they were trying to do with their business, mm -hmm. and they couldn't give it to me. They actually had no plan. There was no strategy other than, uh, we're going to make some software and see if we can sell a lot of it, and you know how to do that. So yeah, I said, I do, but I have to know why this product that you create is better than that one that's next to it on the shelf, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you're not able to give me that. And they said, well, it's, you know, it's got all these features and it does this and that and that. And I said, well, what does that add up to? I mean, who cares about that? Mm -hmm. I'm sure, people read all that and they try to make a decision, but you're not helping them. So mm -hmm. what can you say in 10 words or less that makes people want to buy this one instead of this one? They didn't know. So that was something we learned how to do. Yeah. So working from just the, at the product level of how to brand something, how to message it, uh, we learned how to do whole companies and realized that companies didn't know how to do this either, mm -hmm. even though they talked about branding. Mm -hmm. So I set out to, like, what is this branding thing? And all it really was at the time in the minds of business people was, well, branding is, you know, logos and colors and typefaces and advertising campaigns yeah. and things like that. And I went, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It can't be that. It's got to be something much more important. So that led to thinking and writing about uh, branding. I had a magazine at the time for graphic designers. Yeah. It was about graphic design thinking, yeah. the first magazine on design thinking. And I talked about it a lot, and I kind of met with resistance. People, like they, they didn't want to hear any of that. Mm -hmm. Strategy, mm -hmm. business, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and a, a, you know, a, a bunch of bad things happened to the business all at the same time. We had 9-11, the stock market crash. Yeah. And something else that slips my mind. Yeah. And I think another they, don't, they don't come in one, they, they, no, they, they come, come in, in many, <laughs> many forms. Yeah. Crashing down on me, and yeah. I lost, um, I lost my packaging business, the, 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 the design magazine, mm. and uh, I let all my employees go. Mm. Never had to do that in my whole life. Yeah. My wife and I had mm. built this business up over thirty yeah. years, and yeah. very carefully. And then so, suddenly it just crashes like that. And what so, size of team were you at at that? How many I think we had 15, 15 so time, not, yeah. not as big as you guys yeah. um, and we were doing I would say 75% magazine yeah. and the other 25% was supporting the magazine which hadn't made a profit yet yeah. and everything collapsed and yeah. so I had to let everybody go sadly and sitting around in a warehouse with unsold magazines mm -hmm. uh, by myself and I thought okay what happens now and I thought you know I'm doing this all wrong. I'm trying to tell creative people how to understand business when all these business people are just clamoring to know more about how they can use design. They see the value in it in some vague way, mm. but they don't know anything about it. So I thought, I've just got it backwards. Typical mm. for me. I get everything backwards before I get it right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, uh, I decided I was going to talk to them. I wrote the brand gap. Yeah. Um, to talk about that and instant success. It was a home run. It was um, my publishers after a few weeks said, your book is an evergreen. I said, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> go, that means it's going to sell forever. <laughs> and they were right. It sells the same amount every year. It never yeah. slowed down in the 15 years that it's been going. And that led to 
many other books. So and how many does it sell a year now, roughly? Just as a seven, whole? seven, and a couple others that aren't business books, just yeah, for yeah. the heck of it. But um, and I'm not going to stop because that's yeah. my medium. I'm a graphic yeah, yeah. designer. I can do, I can design them. I can write them. Yeah. I picked up writing on the ways, just as a journalist writing about design, and also then I had this magazine for five years that I was the editor of, and I had to write lots of stuff. So writing a book was just ordinary stuff at yeah. that stage. So uh, that's how I started this whole thing and then uh, that led to um, a company called Neutron. Yeah. Uh, helping companies understand branding from the inside. So instead of doing all the work on the outside like you guys are doing, I yeah. just said, done that. Um, the need is how do we get companies on the inside to embrace this, to know how to use design, yeah. to be prepared to you know, capitalize on it. Um, and that was an instant success. I mean, large companies were saying, come in and read, just tell us how to do this, you know. Help us work together, help us collaborate, tell us who to hire for yeah, advertising, for design, for products. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we created a, a little kind of boutique company just handling the, um, the best clients, the ones we wanted, and mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. quite profitable. Yeah, and did you niche on, again on a sector there, or did you niche on the service offering, or both? Uh, it was a service offering, um, and we did some design. But uh, all the design was uh, for internal use only. In other words, never seen by the outside. But it was award-winning design. Yeah. I mean, if it was yeah. the other kind of design, we would have gotten a lot of yeah. attention. But that's not what we were doing. It was all proprietary, quiet, only the company saw it. Yeah. But it was the high, highest quality design we could do. And it was just yeah. great because for the first time, our clients didn't tell us what they liked and what they didn't like yeah. and what they wanted from us and what was good and what was bad, which they had no business doing yeah. anyway because they don't know anything about it. <laughs> but they hired us on the basis that they don't know anything about it. And so whatever we did, they would just sign off on it. It would be, it's yeah. not important to them. The important thing is they're getting their culture um, aligned around innovation. Yeah, we, we do a lot of that in terms of, you know, we, we call it kind of branding from the inside out. Exactly. That, you know, that I we... think that might have been our tagline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was branding from the inside out. So, uh, and I think it's, it's only just now starting to be a big thing that, you know, a lot yeah. of companies can get involved in because, um, you know, leaders now realize cultures. Yeah. Without it's the, the right biggest culture, thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's the it's biggest the, thing. That's yeah. the thing they have the problem, the biggest problem with because yeah. you wouldn't think that CEOs would have um, any difficulty getting people to follow them. They have all the power. But that's what they complain about. It's like, I don't know what's wrong with this company. I tell them what we're trying to do and they just don't follow me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, how mm -hmm. could that be? <laughs> well, because they don't have the right systems. They're not incentivizing people in the proper way. They're incentivizing maybe with the low level um, incentives like money instead of, um, hey, we want you to um, join in and help us be successful and that's going to be great for you because you're going to get opportunities like you never thought possible. Yeah. That's what people want. They don't want, yeah, exactly. you know, a little perk here and there, you know, a yeah. free tote bag or something for, yeah, yeah. for, for uh, doing something. So um, that's been huge and, um, and, and so I sold that company to Liquid Agency yeah. and they, had, they um, absorbed all, all my materials and methods uh, which left me free to um, go around the world like I am now and sure. talk about this and okay. write books and do workshops, which mm -hmm. I... And so does that free you from the business side now? You don't have to. It think does about yeah? That, I don't yeah. no spreadsheets, no employee <laughs> responsibilities. I think I'm you could so have like, jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I couldn't have done that in the beginning. It, yeah. I had to earn that right. But um, yeah. but I, I it's I'm at a stage in life where I really love doing that and I like travel. So yeah. And uh, now I'm working with Andy to make uh, more of that happen. Yeah. So we have a little enterprise uh, to teach um, leaders designers, strategists, mm -hmm. more about branding, specifically mm -hmm. about branding, yeah. and uh, certify them in this at various levels, like a, almost a karate, kind mm -hmm. of like a black belt mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. Um, but we have five tiers, and uh, we just released the first tier, um, and it looks like it's going to be a big success. We've got just people okay. saying, oh, where can, are you going to bring it to our country? When can we take it? Yeah. When's the next one in London? So we think it's going to be big, and this is going to be our job. Yeah, you know? and the great thing about it is it's translatable to any country, isn't it? Any any culture, anything. If if you know, they speak English, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, I don't speak English. You know. <laughs> when where in this timeline did you realize that you were a designer? Or that, that was when did I realize I was designer? Yeah. When I was seven. Yeah. Yeah, I knew I was like, 
you know when they ask you what do you want to be when you grow up and yeah. the kid over there says I want to be a fire truck <laughs> you know so I, said, I want to be a commercial artist and everyone went what is that um, uh, but I knew because my mother went to art school and, yeah. and she showed me how to draw and that was magic you know I mean if you can draw when you're seven years old or something and you draw a bird or a, like I, I drew these really complicated clipper ships with all the sails in perspective <laughs> coming at you and, and the kids were like like photographically oh, right because yeah, yeah. I learned to make it look mm. to me that's just there's nothing magic about that really it looks magic when it's done but it's just mm. seeing it's just about seeing things in perspective and mm. being good about measuring stuff with your eye and being careful you know and mm. if you care enough to do that you can do it and um and so are you just doing the strategy side now or are you still, do you still? Well, I design my, my books and, my, yeah. and all my presentations. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So um, that's enough design for me. Yeah. And I get to do it exactly the way I want. <laughs> yeah. And it's great. And we hope to be doing some video and stuff like that in the future too, which I'm look, looking forward to doing. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I know how you describe brand and, um, you know, I, I'm always, I really like hearing different people how they describe it. You know, Jeff Bezos. Amazon talks about it's what other people say when you're in the room. Know. Yeah, he didn't invent um, that. <laughs> <Is> that <yours? laughs> no, it wasn't, but uh, I've heard it before. Yeah, and uh, none uh, of these CEOs say anything original, by the way. <laughs> you think they are, they're not. Yeah. Um, but it's great that they're saying it. Yeah, Steve Jobs exactly. said a lot of things uh, yeah. that I've heard before, too, but it's that Steve Jobs said it. Yeah, so I'd love, in your own words, how you know, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you say, how do you describe what brand is, you know? Um, it's a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. Yeah. So um, the, the idea there is that um, we make our purchasing decisions more through emotions than logic, even though we try to use logic. Yeah, really. Back it up with logic, but we make it. Yeah, like, yeah. Right. We, we do it um, through emotion, and then we rationalize it later. Yeah. Often, um, I mean, think about you, you're going to buy a car. Right, and there's all these cars out there, and a lot of them have similar features, but you know they're different. They look a little different. Yeah. But you could get in any one and just drive it. It's yeah. not going to be that different. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's so many features and so many numbers to think about. And, you know, torque and braking power and yeah. stopping distance and accelerate. Oh, who knows? You know, it's, I'm not a car person, but yeah. um, if you start looking at things that way, and then you consider price and like all that, you just drive yourself nuts. And so when pe people start that way, and maybe they make a decision maybe on one or two features, I like the trunk space mm -hmm. or something, uh, usually it's, it's, you can't. You have mm -hmm. to do it through gut feeling. It's the best mm -hmm. way to do it. Yeah. It's a tribe you want to join, isn't it? I did an interesting, I did a yeah. talk a, a while ago there, and I, I took cars and I took all the badges off them, all the logos, off oh, all the cars, all the models, that's, that's and it. I put them up to the audience and I said, you know, do you want number number one, number two, or number three? Yeah. And like, they, they didn't go for the most expensive car. They, they, they ended up going for the one that looked better without the badges. It, it might have been a Hyundai and, or something. And then I, I, yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was, but then I put <coughs> the badges back on and suddenly they all want the Audi. <laughs> you know, they... That, that's the best way to, that's a very good exercise. Um, Take any old car and put a BMW badge on it and uh -huh. see how much the price mm. goes. How much do you think this, price, this yeah. car costs? There's a good social experiment there, isn't it? There? There's something that, you know, is dead interesting. Yeah, and that's the value of that brand. Yeah. If you multiply that by all the cars being sold, that, that's the incremental value that the brand adds. Yeah. And brands can add um, more than 50, they can be more than 50% of the market cap of a company. Yeah. With Apple, I'm sure it's like 70%. Mm. Uh, yeah. is no, it's just nothing. It's in our heads, right? It's what we think yeah, about Apple. Yeah. Um, and I saw that in action, about, you know, maybe 20 years ago now, but uh, when I was doing a lot of research in software and hardware stores, testing uh, our package designs, I would see all the computers lined up on the table. Mm -hmm. And there was a, uh, a, an iMac, it was the one with the, the kind of looked like a big see-through bubble, mm -hmm. you know, bright colors and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah next to an e-machines, which had the same kind of look, maybe not quite as cool, but pretty close, side by side. And e-machines, this is when Apple um, was trying to do what Microsoft did, which was to license software, so it wasn't just mm -hmm. there, uh, it wasn't a walled garden. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so they had, this was the first company that was licensing Apple's OS. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had it, and side by side, and there's a little card on each one, it says what the specs are, and the specs were the same, except for the e-machines had some specs that were better. Mm 
-hmm. So in other words, this machine is actually better than, slightly better than <laughs> that. Okay, and so the, uh, the Macintosh was uh, $1,300 and the E-Machines was $700. Yeah, yeah. You'd think that people would go, well, look at, it's just clearly better and the price is amazing, we'll take it. Yeah. Nobody bought it. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Nobody, uh, they all wanted the Apple, yeah. why? Because of the meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm joining that tribe, yeah. and I trust Apple, they're going to stick with me, I know what they're about, they care about design, I care about design, or whatever it is that you, yeah. that yeah. they care about simplicity, I need simplicity. Yeah. So, um, good lesson right there, I mean, that's just, so that means, you know, large, large part of Apple's value is yeah. in their brand, yeah. and mm -hmm. nothing concrete or material. Yeah, and you and you saw all this change, you know, we all buy in tribes now, and you know, mm. companies that are no longer... You, you know, there's this kind of tribe that surrounds Made Brave and Campfire, and there's you know, and you know, you you saw this stuff really early. You know, how how do you keep ahead all the time? How 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 are you seeing further ahead and kind of? Keeping uh, Andy and I were just talking about that, and yeah. uh, interestingly, you'd think that I'd be like reading all detailed reports of everything that comes out. I don't yeah. at all. In fact, the more I do that, the worse I get mm, at yeah. prediction. <laughs> uh, if I don't pay attention and just let things hit me from far away the most important things get through and the other yeah, ones don't. Yeah. And that's all I've ever done is just like, and, and, and be willing to uh, not believe everything yeah. that people believe. There's so, something great in that. We talk yeah. about that is just like, don't look at Do everyone think, else. Yeah. If, it's, if it's working and your gut is right and you're moving forward and it's going yeah. in the right direction, just I don't keep. Know if it's, for me, it's not my gut as much as I'm questioning everything. Mm -hmm. Anything that people believe, I go, is that really true? <laughs> and then I think, what would make it untrue? Mm -hmm. um, why, what would be good about not doing it that way? And, and so most of my insights come from just thinking wrong about things. Like I said, I make the wrong decision about everything. If, you know, we're staying in hotels. Uh, Andy can attest to this. If I come out of my room, uh, even if I've just come into the room for the first time, I come out, I will turn the wrong way. I will just go the wrong way. They go, oh, come see the elevator's the other way. I don't know what it is. I, uh, you know, my mother taught me how to tie my shoes and I decided I couldn't do it that way. I had to do it a different way. And I did that. I'm still doing it that way. So um, I don't, it's just a mindset for me. Um, and I'm very interested in, in uh, what's going to happen next. Like what should mm -hmm. happen next. More like what should happen. And then I have to test that against mm -hmm. reality. Is it really going to happen? How long is it going to take? Mm -hmm. So. Um, just don't accept anything at its face value. Don't accept that the way things are the way they should be. Mm -hmm. And you'll start thinking about what, what's probably next. Mm -hmm. um, and then be careful about that too, because you can just miss, you can mistime it by years and years. Yeah. And years. Do you ever find that you preempt things too early? Always, yeah. yeah. I have to think about, you know, if nobody else is talking about what I want to talk about, it's probably too early. Yeah. I mean, I wrote a book called Meta Skills. Mm -hmm. um, uh, six Talents for the Robotic Age. Mm -hmm. This was mm, 10 years ago now. No, not 10 years ago. Seven years ago. Um, about the workplace of the future when machines start to really get in high gear and um, they become really predictive. They do a lot of work that we're doing now. Um, what becomes of us? I mean, what does it mean to be human in, the, in, a, in an age of artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. And then my whole thing was, well, uh, our human creativity is going to come to the fore. It has to. That's mm -hmm. what's going to be valuable. And so I laid out the whole thing about what is that? What is that? Where does that come from? And I went all the way back to the beginning of the world. Basically, I had to do a lot of research yeah, for that. Yeah, the beginning of the world. I mean, who knows what? Um, what I do now? So, um, so I start with uh, I start with cave paintings in France where mm -hmm. that I visited because we have a house there. Uh, these wonderful cave paintings and um, and draw a straight line from there to where we are. And then say, okay, now we can see this whole pattern that's laid out in front of us. There's nothing surprising about what's happening mm -hmm. now. This, all this technology, this isn't machines really, this is us, mm -hmm. right? This is an extension of human beings. Mm -hmm. So, but, but we have choices. Where, where are we going to take all this stuff? So it's, it uh, lays out a case for the importance of aesthetics and mm -hmm. what, what, what are they or what is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, how, we, how will we be valuable as human beings when machines take over a lot of this yeah. work? And so... That was kind of way ahead of its time, mm -hmm. and still today, I think it's uh, hardly gets any readership at all, except by philosophers. And yeah, and I was really meaning it for policymakers and educators, but they're like, "Who? 
you don't know what a big change this is to introduce this kind of stuff from where we are now. So I realized, okay, slow down. <laughs> so I overshot that by 20 years. It's not hard to do that, by the way. It's not a you know, genius or anything. It's just like you just um, read the... You know, you just read the tea leaves, you see where everything's going, you go, oh, okay. I mean, I, I'm reading people that are predicting 50 years out, so, mm -hmm. uh, and they'll probably be pretty correct. But what good is that to you? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm starting yeah, to yeah. tell you, I'm going to be like, I'm going to be maybe 10 years ahead max, mm -hmm. so it's doable and my books will last that long. Yeah. And uh, that's the sweet spot. And it's hard to hit sometimes. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, how much of your success, I suppose, to date, do you attribute to the books? Do you think it was based mm. on the launch of Brand Gap and everything, then that set you off? Everything. Yeah. Um, and I know people don't read books, blah, blah, blah. Yes, they do. The right people do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a book makes you clarify your logic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's there forever, right? It's printed there. And... Um, if you're serious about doing a book that will last, you really have to make sure every single word is right. Mm -hmm. And that makes you think in a, a really precise way. And I need that because I'm not a precise person. I'm really uh, intuitive. And yeah. so this is kind of like runs counter to, mm -hmm. to who I am. So I need that. That's, that, that's how I do it. Um, I have to do a lot of research. I have to keep very good notes. I have to make sure there's logic and everything. But at the same time, I'm surprising people so they turn the page. Yeah. And how long does that process take for you? Is it you uh, know, these like books, like the brand flip that you have there? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Is um, probably uh, after I do the initial research, nine months nine from months. including uh, writing and design production. So mm -hmm. pretty short. But then I might do two years of reading before that, mm -hmm. kind of figuring out mm -hmm. what I want to say. Yeah. And I don't ever. Um, start a book until I have a title and a cover mm -hmm. designed <laughs> because I've <laughs> seen how that can go wrong if like, you write a beautiful book and I was like what are we going to call it you know? <laughs> and then you pick something stupid and then some designer does a really bad job on the cover <laughs> I've done bad jobs on my own covers so I mean I know how easy that is yeah. but uh, I always have that first so and do you write it all or do you work with writers or no I write you write it yeah. um, well interestingly good question I do have help um, my last book called Scramble is a business thriller mm -hmm. so it's written as a piece of fiction mm -hmm. because it enabled me to um, to get into the heads of executives as they're trying to do advanced work on branding mm -hmm. like what's that really like it's, it's not just following lists and everything it's got to be much more nuanced than that and of course it is because when you're trying to do any kind of new thing in a business, you've got obstacles, you've got setbacks, you've got human beings to deal with, you've got yeah. sabot saboteurs in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. All this stuff happens. It's pretty thrilling stuff. So why not just write it that way and, mm -hmm. and illustrate it with a story that instead of trying to find an example in the real world and then not really knowing the mm -hmm. full story. I mean, you can get a case study and guess at things, but you're never going to have a CEO tell you how he felt about something. Yeah. So what I did is um, um, I had a, a bunch of CEOs, especially one, uh, Andrea Dorigo, um, who loved my book Metaskills, so that endeared me to him immediately. Um, mm -hmm. And he says, you know, you really should write that, write the book, write a book as a story, and I'll help you because you know you, you haven't run a big company. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I used him and some other CEOs and a bunch of uh, other audience members to help me through this story, the whole plot and what's in it and everything. So I would just release a chapter at a time to first to my um, CEO friends and then and then later to uh, the whole the rest of the potential audience. Yeah. Um, and got lots of feedback like. Uh, I love that character. Oh, that doesn't that doesn't ring true for me. You you know. Oh, you're leaving out something that I've experienced. You know, mm. it's like oh yeah, God, you know. So I go back and rewrite it. So you know, there's forty about forty chapters. So that's forty conversations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really. And then uh, that was key. I don't think it would have been on target without hearing back from people. So. Mm. You have a hit before you even publish it. You know, mm -hmm. you know, people are saying. I'm going to buy 10 of these, yeah. you know, my whole team. Um, and I think it's great. I don't know if I could do that with uh, like the, my other whiteboard books. Mm -hmm. 
because there'd be so much, um, new, so many new ideas in there that I would just end up going in circles with people who couldn't quite understand it. That, so in, the, in that case, I would have to just really think through it. But when a story, people relate to stories really easily. Yeah. So if it doesn't ring true, they'll tell you. Um, why, if, why, why do you think storytelling has become so big? You know that you know I, I'm a big believer uh, in storytelling, yeah. and you know obviously because the world are, because the world is really complex and we can't understand it logically. Yeah, <laughs> it's just too hard. That's why yeah. Netflix and Amazon and Apple mm -hmm. are going crazy with content and stories mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's the way we can get at these complicated issues, mm -hmm. um, and all the complexity is in there. But somehow we managed to understand that better than if you broke it down into just the principles and mm -hmm. rules to follow. Um, yeah. you, the, you speak about research a lot as well. Like how, how do you think you get research right and why do you think it's an important, valuable bit of making good work? Well, it depends what it is. I mean, if you're talking about books, um, if I know what the title is and what the subject is and what I want people to take away, then I have to make sure I understand all the parts you know, I'll do it like, here are the parts I need to make this case. And now here's a few parts I don't, really don't understand. I'm not, you know, uh, I don't know a lot about retail, for example, what the challenges are there. So let me read a couple books on mm -hmm. those challenges. And they may be kind of dry for most people, but I'm taking notes, right? And I'm saying, God, that's, that's a great insight. And so um, with my research, it's mostly reading. A lot of it's online, a lot of it's in books. And I have a giant stack of three by five cards, and I, anything I see that strikes me as usable, I'll write it out. The whole thing might mm -hmm. fill up a whole card, and I'll just put it in a pile. And as I'm thinking about that, I may say, "Oh, I've got an insight that nobody said." Mm -hmm. You know, Ooh, write that down. This is something I've seen. Okay, mm -hmm. write that. So I've got all these cards, and then at the end, I look at, I just go through them all, and I put them in piles, and those piles become chapters, and those mm -hmm. chapters get put in mm -hmm. a certain order. That makes sense, and then I and then I uh, have all these things to talk about, and then I can start writing. Um, and some cards never get used, mm -hmm. and, but it flows pretty quickly. It, then it's just a mm -hmm. journeyman work. At, journeyman work at that stage, you're just like plowing through it. You're writing. You're seeing how to make connections. You go back, and, and I would say, typically, when I write a book, by the time I get to the end, the first draft is about ninety percent good. It's not rough. I can't mm -hmm. stand going back and untangling things that never should have been written. Mm -hmm. So it's just really about tidying things up and um, uh, you know, tying loose ends, making sure that um, you foreshadow things that you're going to talk about later, yeah. that when they hit in the end, they, they, they resonate because you read it in the beginning. Ah, oh, 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 fantastic. Especially with fiction. I mean, you see all that stuff becomes really important. Characters mm -hmm. become important. Um, foreshadowing. Uh, emotions, the emotional arc of a story is it has its own story, yeah, like, yeah. you know, and you have to pay attention to that if you want people to get to the end of the book. Yeah, so yeah. I learned a lot of that through Scramble, my latest book, and, yeah. and if, if that does what I think it'll do, I'll probably write, I have two more, and I have the covers and titles on it. I'm halfway <laughs> through that on Audible at the moment. So. On Audible? Yeah. Hey, uh -huh. how is it? Yeah. It's good on Audible, yeah. This one's not on Audible, though, is it? So it isn't, no. Get that uh, because, so I'm publishing my books now because yeah. Amazon has forced us all to become uh, self-publishers you know, okay, in business. Yeah. It's just, uh, there's no money in it if you work through a publisher yeah. for them or you. So they've kind of forced us into this position. Yeah. So, um, But then I own I yeah. own the rights to it and I can do my own audiobooks because if, if the publisher doesn't pay for it, yeah. I mean, just to record a normal mm. audiobook is about $10,000 and yeah. it takes maybe... A week of time to 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 record it and then then to edit it and uh, and then rehearsing before that you know yeah, all sure, that stuff sure. takes time and uh, if they don't want to pay for it yeah and, I, I but, did, they're, I did. but they're going to make all the money yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know so I, I did I did zag if you're interested in yeah. one of the uh, whiteboard I've read, books I've listened to that one okay yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I really like it and I, I learned a lot with this last one about reading like <laughs> dramatic reading that I had yeah. no. You know, I started paying attention to actors and uh -huh. uh, what, how you use your voice, and I'm still not there yet, but I think I made a, uh -huh. a I like, halfway I, I there. I like how quick these are. These are really good. The, you know, yeah, the I, I, those I, are I, called whiteboard uh, yeah. overviews, and they're yeah. designed to be read in two hours yeah. on a plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that. Well, not on a plane, but I did it under two hours. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, two it hours. worked, it worked. But yeah. they should be uh, rich enough with insights that you keep going back because you go, yeah. what is it? How, how do I express that? I need to 
Yeah. Talk to my client about that, and you can go back and find it pretty easily. That's totally what we do. Yeah. Our creative director, Stephen, he's always running over to me. Remember, remember this, and kind of highlight <laughs> well, something. Yeah. And, you know, and just, yeah. So I t- <laughs> I've taken to just taking those um, those things and sticking them in at the end, so you don't have to even look for them. They're just they're there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. You know. It's interesting on on the Kindle, on Kindle books. Um, uh, people read those books and then they highlight things in their copies and that shows up on everybody's. Once mm. you get to like a little sentence that a lot of people have underlined, really like it's underlined, idea. you buy the book oh, and it's, oh, it's already underlined yeah. by everybody else. <laughs> and yeah. for an author, I can go and say, yeah, <laughs> are a lot of, well, those are a lot of underlined. <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody once said, you know, I started highlighting everything in them and the whole book was yellow. So <laughs> That's kind of what I it was like, a yeah. highlighted, pre-highlighted <laughs> story. Yeah. Um, but but I love to, to go through my Kindle books and go, oh, that's what mm-hmm. people are really liking. Well, wow, to me, that was almost a throwaway, but to them, that's really important. So, kind of heat map, yeah. Yeah, and then I'll keep that that's and good, pull that forward or I'll put it in a talk and make sure that I cover that because obviously people think that's, some, that's important. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, I've got um, a sort of question around, you know, sometimes when you go into a company and, you know, you know the brand needs to change or evolve mm-hmm. or something needs to happen, the, the first job usually as a creative agency or strategy is that you know you've got a board of people and sometimes you've got half a board that don't agree or don't believe in branding and you know another half that do and want to see change and you know we do a lot of trying to educate on what brand means at that point and why you know they should invest in it I'm interested to know how you approach that part of the creative process so when you've got a room that's still not bought in and you know you arrive and what, what, what does that look like? Well, we don't get to work with boards of directors very much because they meet yep. separately. Um, if we did, um, that would be interesting. Sometimes we get a board <laughs> member in on a, what we call a swarm, mm-hmm. where we have uh, all the leaders together with our team um, banging through some prototypes of what, what change would look like in mm-hmm. some form. It's nice to have a representative from the board there who can report back. Mm-hmm. But mostly it's um, getting the CEO and the other leaders together with the appropriate um, um, department heads uh, and the project owners, whatever it is, and um, getting an understanding together of what a brand is, what it could mean for the company, uh, a, a good idea of where they are now, mm-hmm. and a good idea of where they could go, and then trying to figure out a path between A and B, yeah. um, which may require... Uh, rewriting the purpose of the company. It could require uh, repositioning products Mm -hmm. or the company itself. Mm -hmm. It could require changing the culture. Um, It may be inventing some products like in a rough form and Mm -hmm. whatever it takes. We plan a week, like five days, four to five days Mm -hmm. of just eight hours of really intense work. Everybody working at the same time all at once uh, to come up with some visualization of what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. It could be products, it could be a new name, it could be um, uh, a new business model, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it could be anything. Um, And it's really intense for people who haven't done this. It's intense for us, but for for the company, they're seeing their life flash in front of them because they're seeing a lot of bad ideas being thrown out and they're going, no, no, we can't do that. Um, But we always say, look, bad ideas can turn into good ideas. Yeah. Because uh, uh, ideas are like, um, you know, they're like babies. They're, they're helpless. You have to nurture them. You know, you don't, <laughs> you don't you know, give up a baby just because it can't hold a job. You, you, you know, you, you raise them, right? And you train them. Um, and so, and don't worry about the bad ideas. They will never end up seeing the light of day. But the bad ideas are stepping stones to good ideas. Yeah. And so once they understand that, they can relax and just say, you know, you're in total control of this. But wait until you see what happens because it's going to be amazing. <laughs> now you're going to see uh, ideas that you never even imagined just sort of sh- come to life out of things like purpose and mm-hmm. differentiation mm-hmm. and a bunch of minds working on this at the same time. Later we can test our assumptions, uh, make sure they're right. We can do all that research, but we can get really far just with the brains we have in this room. Yeah. Watershed moment for me. I um, I moved to Silicon Valley because I saw what Apple was doing, and I thought, "Wow! I mean, these guys are so creative. These two Steves, mm-hmm. and uh, I know they would really appreciate what I could bring to this because I, I can see what they're trying to do, and I know I could help them do that. Mm-hmm. 
I need to get to know them first and see if there's a, you know, any relationship possible. So I, I um, moved my company from Southern California up to Silicon Valley and started getting clients. And I got my chance redesigning all the packaging for all their software, which they had uh, um, published under a different name, Claris. So Claris was their company for, mm. they, they spun off this, uh, uh, all the software. And that's, I mean, that was a watershed project for me because um, we transformed not only their so packaging, but the whole packaging, software packaging industry. We created a look mm -hmm. that uh, everyone copied Still going. Oh, yeah. yeah. A, a, a logic to the system of how you do it. What yeah. goes on the front of a packet, the back, the side, the top. What you have to say about it. How you talk about it. How you sell it. Mm -hmm. All that stuff we pioneered. And yes, like you say, it's still going in some form. Um, cool. But that was that was uh, great for us. And we you know, became a really successful Is that your company. most... Um, Sort of, is that your favorite project, your most iconic, or the one that you... Yeah, you I know, think, that, you know, of all the graphic design projects I've done, I probably would point to that because I love the people. Yeah. I loved working with the CEO of that company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I learned a lot, and a lot, a lot about testing. Uh, mm -hmm. So up to that point, you know, designers don't like to test anything. They don't want to really know mm -hmm. what people think of it. They want to believe <laughs> something about how great their work is, but they don't really want to know because they might have to change something or they might feel bad about it. So, you know, oh, we don't, you know, we don't really test our things. It's all intuition and yeah. we're just so smart that we don't need to do that. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of thought maybe we're smart, but um, I can probably sell a lot more of these projects if I can... Um, make companies feel that um, the the product the, the the package that they choose is going to be successful yeah. before they even yeah. bring it to market it. because yeah. we've mm -hmm. proven it mm -hmm. in you know yeah. in theory really but with testing mm -hmm. in an actual store with actual customers buying products in that actual ca category yeah. so we just invented this really quick way of doing that and um, it was hugely successful, and boy, did I learn about, a lot about design and what I didn't know about it and what none of us knew about it. Mm -hmm. You know, most designers, if, especially when they get really sophisticated, they overshoot the audience by 10 miles. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they really expect that people are going to uh, see stuff in their work that they see, and it's not true at all. Oh, they don't yeah. care about that. I mean, they're just focused on some very superficial thing, and if you forget that, it doesn't matter how deep your design yeah. is. If it doesn't work on the shallow mm -hmm. level... It's not going to work. So I, I uh, learned a lot about that. And what I learned really is um, don't trust yourself. You know, test everything. Yeah. Anything that's important, test it first. Learn from it. Uh, and you'll be learning about different groups of people, how different groups of people think. Mm -hmm. You know, depending on what profession they're from or what sort of social tribe they're from they're going to mm -hmm. think differently they're going to have this sort of group think that you can tap into and it's probably not going to be your group uh, it'll be somebody else's if you're a professional mm -hmm. so um, it's good to learn about that and uh, the more you learn to respect your audience the better your work is and mm -hmm. that's that's a lesson that designers still need to get cozy with mm -hmm. do you think that testing helped the client to trust you to do something Absolutely. more brave yeah, they stopped telling us what to do because yeah. they asked us, okay, what should we do now that we got that feedback? Mm -hmm. You know, we have some ideas, you know, mm -hmm. and so um, they stopped telling us how to design stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we like the blue one, did not, mm -hmm. not yeah, matter anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, what if we show you the blue one is the third best out of these? Are you still going to mm -hmm. like it? Well, <laughs> no, <Yeah>. probably not. <laughs> if we think customers are going to buy it, that's the good one. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's... Yeah. So uh, it doesn't mean that uh, aesthetics don't count. It, all that stuff, those are all tools to get something to happen with in people's heads. But um, uh, aesthetics by themselves uh, can really mislead you and take you in the wrong direction. Yeah. How do you think in the kind of, I suppose, age of the algorithm where things are infinitely optimized and machine mm -hmm. learning, how yeah. do you keep the kind of creative magic alive you know, the kind of... Well, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's just another battle we all have to fight. It's like, when is it good and when isn't it good? Uh, can machines know something that people don't know? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Can they believe something that people don't believe? No, probably not. Because mm -hmm. it's more like machines will reflect our beliefs. 
-hmm. more than our desire for actual knowledge. I mean, you, you could program something to do anything, probably. I don't know. Uh, I think it's a, that whole thing is like emotions can lead you to better understanding sometimes than, than numbers and you know, evidence. Mm -hmm. So you have to weigh both and see if there's a difference between them and then, then to kind of decide and negotiate that difference. Mm -hmm. This is not an easy time we're heading into. It's not going to make everything easy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marty. Thanks for joining us. You've been an absolute delight. Um, and thanks to you guys. Um, thanks for joining us for our second episode of Just a Chat With. Um, the next one will be out in one month.